us. Today we have a conversation with someone who is into communications. In fact, she has done that over the last 20 plus years. At a point, she was communications coordinator for the Afrobarometer between 2009 to 2013. Now she talks more about citizenship matters, democracy, uh, our constitution and more. I'm talking about none other than the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education in the person of my own good old friend, it's been a while, Kathleen Addy. Hello, Kathleen. Hi. It's been ben. forever. It's been forever, but it's good to see you again. What uh, mm -hmm. are you doing? It's not for me to me to with that. I think the last time I saw you, you came to our yes. office and you were having some engagements. Yes. You've mm -hmm. been pretty hands-on in your approach. But I noticed since June last year, mm -hmm. you took over from Josephine Nkrumah yes. as the chairperson in full from deputy. Yes. What has the experience been like? Well, thankfully, I came to the job prepared because prior to becoming chair, I had worked as the deputy for a number of years. Yeah. So thankfully, I was, well I was well prepared to take up the position. It's a complex job and, and it's very difficult to see the complexity or to even explain the complexity. And so coming at it from a position where I'd been exposed to the inner workings of the commission and I'd been here, know the people and all of that before becoming chair was a huge advantage for me. And so has made it really given me a bit of a soft landing. Mm -hmm. You know, even though, you know, we all have our problems, but it's been great because of that. Right. So the experience, obviously, I recall there were times when we were talking about the Constitution, taking it bit by bit in yes. my former yes. <laughs> place. Yes, yes, yes. We did that Empire. for a while. Yeah. We, did, we did that for a while. I mean, the Constitution, we, we, we talk about it like we talk about everything else. And it, it, it seems like one of those things, it's fairly abstract to a lot of people. Mm. And uh, people say, amend the constitution, change the constitution. You ask them and they haven't even looked at it. They barely opened the page. But it really is the thing that ties us together. Right. Because otherwise, everybody will have their own idea about how to run their affairs. Mm. Every community will have their own set of rules as to how to, to, to run their, you know, their community ship or whatever. But the constitution makes us a, a, a nation you know right. it gives us the rules that cut across everybody and everybody has to live by those rules and guidelines so it is a very important document you know and it is the pillar on which our democracy stands and we we must we must take it more seriously i guess we have to find a way of making the constitution I don't know whether more accessible and we'll be, we'll be focusing on the constitution and whether to amend or not okay. usually people would want to focus on article 71 and this sure, and that sure. but mm. what do you start to talking about mm -hmm. the, the the preamble to the constitution you read it it talks about the aspirations of the Absolutely, people yes. some would say that look since 1992 segueing into 1993 when it actually took mm -hmm. off till now because the birth of the ncc actually mm -hmm. came along with Absolutely. the start of the mm -hmm. fourth republic so mm -hmm. it's been about just about 30, 30 years. years yes mm -hmm. after that protracted length of time mm -hmm. sometimes have the aspirations of the people changed mm -hmm. 30 years is enough to capture a generation or two Absolutely. but we'll get into that context okay. first off I want to find out what is the core mandate of the sure. NCCE. Sure. There are so many things that if you were to hit, hit the streets now mm -hmm. and ask people, someone would probably ask Enosi Ede. So tell us, <laughs> what is the core mandate of the yes. NCCE? Some will probably ask Enosi Ede and some will say that NCC is responsible for absolutely everything that goes wrong because we did not teach the people. Mm. So our mandate primarily is to propagate the constitution get Ghanaians to understand it and live by it. Um, that's our primary mandate. Subsequently, beyond that, we are supposed to work to entrench the democracy. Every time I answer this question, I have to remind the listeners of where we have come from. Mm. At the time that we started working towards a fourth republic, we had been under military rule for a while. And a whole generation had only known a military rule. And so going from military rule um, to a democracy overnight, literally overnight, is, is, a, is, a, is a bit of a culture shock mm. because the rules of engagement are completely different in the two systems. 
and wisely the those who um wrote the constitution the, the the people who put the constitution together thought it wise you know to set up this institution because somebody needs to teach the democracy nobody's born a democrat nobody's born mm -hmm. a good citizen nobody's born waving any particular flag all these things are taught and so wisely they thought let's put let's have it an institution whose sole mandate is to ensure that this democracy does not fall the way and this this republic does not fall the the constitution is not overthrown you know as it has happened in the past because we do have a history as a country you know the fourth republic is the fourth republic because the first three republics were overthrown so all of these all of this thinking went into the setting up of the the institution and i think that it it was it was a very smart move on the part of the framers of the constitution mm. do you feel we've done enough i was going to get into something else but on the back of what you just said mm. do you feel we've done enough to safeguard our constitution and here's the angle i'm mm -hmm. going to take it from you would realize that in the ivory coast or in cote d'ivoire as mm -hmm. they prefer to be called Alassane Ouattara mm -hmm. has tweaked the system mm -hmm. to have a third term. Mm -hmm. We see that in many other African mm -hmm. countries, mm -hmm. and there are so many different things happening. Mm -hmm. We have not had such an experience, yeah. and yet people still look at the Constitution and wonder whether it is still fit for purpose mm -hmm. after 30 years. Mm -hmm. Like I cited earlier, some will tell you about political party funding and mm -hmm. what our Constitution mm -hmm. says versus the reality mm -hmm. about certain public sector officers and what they ought to do mm -hmm. uh, when they take public office and what is happening declaration mm -hmm. of assets among mm -hmm. others these are very problematic areas mm -hmm. article 71 office holders mm -hmm. and of how, which i am one by the way exactly <laughs> how do you reflect on them in recent times and i'm putting a whole number of things okay. together the president when he was appointing you mm -hmm. said there have been calls to sort of quash mm -hmm. the ncc that yes. this body is no longer relevant how does that resonate with our constitution and how relevant is the ncce mm -hmm. to that process to Ghanaians and to our democratic practice okay so um you've asked several questions and i'll try and unravel them it's the a yarn, of, going <laughs> a yarn the, of questions the first one is about the, the the constitution and the and the you know the public discussion around how to fix it moving forward because um, a lot of people feel that there are bits of it that is broken and it's fixing. I mean, even if you... Do you agree? Oh, it's not my place to agree or disagree. You're we a citizen of this country. What do you think? Pardon me? You're a citizen of this country. No, but if You're I speak on the constitution, I speak as chairman of the NCC and as chairman of the NCC, I do not have a strong position on this because mm. it must be about the will of the people. And so as NCC, our angle really is to ensure that the voices of all Ghanaians go into whatever changes we are going to make. It's really not about us saying this needs to be changed and that needs to be changed. We can facilitate those discussions. We can create the platforms for those discussions to happen. We can participate in those discussions, but it's not really um, in, our, in our, it's not our place it's to really purview. call. It's not no, in your no, purview. no, no. I don't right. think so. I think that, um, first of all, you must understand that our mandate is an education mandate. Right. It's not a mandate of going to do assessment of constitution to decide what's in and what's out. Mm. And the education mandate really um, enjoins us to ensure that people understand the constitution. Therefore, if there are going to be changes, then we have to ensure that people um, have an input into into the changes and so as to the specific things that need to be changed and all of that um, from the point of view of the commission i don't think we have a strong opinion on any of it personally if you ask me i would say that primarily issues around the election of heads of local government i think that that is a strong one from all the information that we have gathered and we have gathered a lot you know um, NCC was part of, um, partnered with the, the, the commission set up by President Atta Mills to start the work around the Constitutional Review you mean Commission. The Constitutional Review, 2010? Yes. yes, in 2010. Right. NCC did the work of um, 
you know, pulling people together, um, town hall meetings, and all of that, did the logistic, logistical work around that to ensure that there was maximum participation and that the voice of the people was actually, you know, part of the final document. Um, in the last year, in, in last year, um, we did a lot of work around the constitution as well. Um, we had a national dialogue on the theme. We had several engagements in, in, the, in, the, in the regions on the same theme of um, changing the constitution, or amending the constitution. And we had a round table to look at the white paper that came out of the constitutional review process that um, was subsequently shelved. So we've done a lot of it, a lot of work. And so from all that we've done, the one thing that well, I can mention a couple of things that keep coming up or whoever, wherever we speak to Ghanaians, and one would be um, election of heads of um, local government. I think that is a very important thing. That, that is actually surprising to a lot of people considering that Ghana is considered a fairly established democracy, at least in our sub-region. It comes as a surprise to people that, in spite of all of that, uh, the heads of local government are still appointed. Right. You know, and um, I hosted a, a would-be politician only yesterday, and she was talking about the issue. But I guess the point most people would make is, uh, wouldn't the politics, mm -hmm. the politics of the major political parties, NDC and MPP, devolve there? But I usually say that look, it's there already. <laughs> Whether no, it's but, staring us in the but, face. But, 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 but this is the other thing. If we are going to practice a democracy, mm. political parties mm. are a core part of that arrangement. Mm. The architecture of a democracy involves, or of a multi-party democracy for that matter, involves political parties. And so this thing about how, oh, we don't want the poison of the political parties to spread, I think it's, you know, we really, really look at that, that point of view again. The political parties are the political parties. We elect them. Mm. No, no political party in this fourth republic has imposed its will on anybody. These are the people that the people elect. These are the parties that the people elect. And we must respect that. We must respect that. I right. mean, if we are going to be in a democracy, we should respect the rules of the game. Mm. If we say, for instance, that, oh, then maybe we, should, we need to do some work ar ar around the political parties so that and uh, when a party wins power, you know, they come with a, a certain democratic culture that, you know, infiltrates or throughout the, 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 the system of governance. Y you understand? We can work, we can think about that. There's, I think there's a lot of work that can be done in the political parties. There's a lot of improvement that the political parties can benefit from. But to say that, um, to act as if the, the, the political parties are the problem in a sense, in that sense, I think it's, 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 it's we're missing the point. It's not we're missing the point. Right. But because if it's not these political parties, it will be some other political parties. As long as we are, we are, we are practicing a multi-party democracy, mm -hmm. do you see what I mean? And, so, and even if it isn't the political parties, it will be people it will affiliated be people. to them in some way. And so. I hope that we will come to this that point in the discussion where we talk about the roles that we all have to play. Mm -hmm. You know, the responsibilities that we all carry mm -hmm. because. The democracy will not build itself. It's the people who will build it. The governance does not automatically become good governance unless people are involved. Right. You know? So maybe at a, at some, later in the discussion, we'll come we'll, to we'll that. We'll sneak it in. Mm -hmm. It's been three decades, though, just to stay briefly on that point. Mm -hmm. Two questions. It's been three decades of the 1992 Constitution, mm -hmm. January 7th, so mm -hmm. we mark Constitution Day and all of that ordinarily. The lifespan of a constitution. There mm -hmm. are places where, I mean, there are frequent changes. The UK has its own very fluid system mm -hmm. and written constitution doesn't mean it's not written at all, but they have their own system. Would you say after three decades it is fitting to go back and reflect? And do you think with what happened in 2010, mm -hmm. I am one of those who feel that was an opportunity missed mm -hmm. because I read a lot of what the committee came up with mm -hmm. Uh, the commission, I beg your pardon, came up with. And then I saw aspects of the white paper and it left me a bit exactly. flabbergasted. Exactly. So two questions. After mm -hmm. three decades, ordinarily, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there'll be so much evolution or change. No. Wouldn't wouldn't any 
democracy have made some changes already and did we miss that opportunity in 2010 what do you think well to the extent that the work was put in the money was spent mm. and nothing came of it it was a missed opportunity but it's not what more do you think we could have done with it one more we could oh we could have implemented the things that we found out mm. we could have actually gone ahead and 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 effected the changes but it didn't happen so yes it was a missed opportunity but it's not it doesn't mean that it's the end of that road right 30 years is also a good time to reevaluate how far we've come to look at what we can what we can change and at this point, if we are going to do any work, that work that was done in 2010 should be a core part because that work was very comprehensive. You know, the report was very comprehensive, collecting all the views of Ghanaians from ac across the country. And of course, even from 10 years ago, a lot has changed. Yeah. So even those recommendations might be, might, by, might, you know, we may need by to now, subject that right. to some review as well. Mm. So there's mm. a lot of work that can be done, should be done, because there's no time like now. You know, it should have been done in 2010. It wasn't done. I mean, we've come to a point, you know, a, a, a critical point, which is 30 years or, or, of, of the Fourth Republic is a time for reflection. It's actually a good time to really look at it and say we can we can tweak this year or we can change this day or or whatever and, and, and get on with it. But it is it is it is time for that. All right. Thirty years. So the NCC and the nineteen ninety two constitution are like conjoined twins. Your birth Mother was around, and child. Exactly. <laughs> around this very same yes. year. You came actually on the back of the 1992 yes. constitution. But would you say 30 years on, mm -hmm. the, 19, uh, the, the NCC has mm -hmm. lived up to its billing, has lived up to expectation. Mm -hmm. On the back of, sometimes as a journalist, mm -hmm. when I go around, mm -hmm. the things I hear, oh, some don't know what the NCC is. Mm -hmm. Those who know think you're not really doing anything. Mm -hmm. Others think you're doing something, but not enough. Mm -hmm. Have you lived up to the billing? Okay, so, um, <laughs> First of all, I think that uh, because the outcome of the work of the NCC is an intangible, it, it is very easy to dismiss the, institu the institution. You, you understand? It's not the institution where you can count bridges and schools or concrete that has been poured or trees that have been planted or anything like that because this is an institution that works on the minds of people and it's very difficult to count that. But we can look at some things in, in terms of the work of the commission and the democracy that has held for 30 years. The fact that uh, at the beginning of the Fourth Republic, the commission was set up and 30 years down the line, we still remain a republic, you can have a certain relation, you can have a certain um, correlation there. The fact that the work that we do is highly decentralized at the community level and a lot of things go into holding the peace and keeping the country together. And a lot of that work that we do are things that people don't see. They're not glamorous things. They're not flashy things. Mm -hmm. They're things around calling communities together, solving problems, you know, um, reminding everybody of their rights and responsibilities, you know, doing arbitration, um, working with the political parties, for instance, to help us stay on a stable course around the time of elections. These are things that um, the outcome is normality. The outcome is peace. The outcome is successful elections. The outcome is normal life. So it's very difficult to count. Perhaps things we take for granted? Yes, we do take it for granted because we've had it good compared mm. to our neighbors. Mm. So we do take it for granted. But the commission has actually achieved a lot. Um, and I was just about to get to that. So tell us about something. <laughs> has achieved a lot. Um, if you look at the programs that we do, you know, the programs, the, the flagship programs that we, 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 we do, you will realize that um, we, we have actually impacted people fairly positively. Uh, but 
right off the bat, I have to say that of course we have not worked at our full potential. That 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 this is this this is an institution that has um, barely scratched its potential. Why do you think that is? Oh, we'll come to that. But the thing is that we have been part of the success of the country's um, 30 years of peace and stability. The programs that we run, Constitution Week, like what we started yeah. now, every Constitution Week we engage security forces. We engage the soldiers, the police, armed forces, um, all these groups, you know, people who wield guns officially, and we remind them of the democracy that we have all committed to. Mm. Um, who knows what would have happened without those reminders? You can't tell. But every Constitution Week, for years and years and years, we speak to these people. We know our history. We know where we are coming from. We know the roles that different, different institutions have played in, 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 uh, in our story, in our governance and political story. And so these continuous engagements, you know, do, you know, it helps in keeping our, our country together. During Citizenship Week, we engage um, students. We go into the classrooms, and that, that is just a special week. We do have classroom engagements as part of general work, but during Citizenship Week, we go to classrooms, we take upstanding members of, of society. I'm sure you've You've, you've been in Citizenship Week before. If not, please, note him for the next one. You know, we take journalists, doctors, teachers, and we work with them, interacting with students, so that it's not just about um, us saying that it is, this is how to be a good citizen, this is how to be a responsible citizen, but it's people who have come through the system and are in a better position to advise the young. We've done that a lot uh, in every year. We have civic education clubs in schools, and these clubs, um, through these clubs, we are able to get at least the in-school youth to, you know, be civic-minded. And even though in terms of civic, the civic-mindedness skill, there's still a lot to be done, it's not a completely hopeless situation. Mm -hmm. Given what we've had to work with, we've managed to do a lot. Currently, we have over 5,000 civic education clubs around the country in, in the um, second and third cycle institutions. If you look at the number, it's woefully inadequate. But there's reasons why we can't even have simple things like clubs that we actively engage with in all schools. I mean, ideally, if we had civic clubs in all schools, it would be more impactful. But Has there been an attempt? Oh, it's, it boils down. It boils down to logistics because we have, we are we are set up to actually deploy it if we have the resources to be able to do it. Mm. You know, um, we are working to see civics back brought back into the curriculum, because um, if from day one of stepping into a school, every child, every term, every semester has a, a civics course that they do. Mm right up until the end of your, 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 your undergrad, uh, right up to you, 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 know, you get your undergrad degree, it will go a long way because building mindsets is not something that happens overnight. I it's mean, not a campaign that you can just run for six months and then it's done. Hmm. You must be committed to it and you must do it consistently and invest consistently over and you must have a long-term view of at least medium to long term view of the outcome. So if you put all of this in context, Commission has done quite well mm. over the years. It's interesting you bring that. Studying in Cuba, one thing mm -hmm. I, I got to realize was that uh, some may call it propagandist, that country being semi-socialist, mm -hmm. that's how I describe them, but they fed the minds of <laughs> the populace right from youth Absolutely. about this, uh, this agenda. Yes. Of the country. Yes. And uh, mm. positive or negative, it was bought into. I mean, everyone had a very concrete it's idea not, of. It's not a negative. Of, and, and, no, I'm, I'm just saying, def it's depending not, let on me tell you, who, is, who oh, is reflecting on I it. know, I'm, and I'm coming in because you say Cuba and sort of semi socialist, but it doesn't matter the type of country. Right. Every country that is a powerful country today has employed, um, has, has been able to deploy education programs 
and it doesn't matter whether they are left of center right or so right. communist capitalist all of them china Chi singapore the us mm. the uk mm. i mean the uk have built a brand out of what yeah out of what exactly out of the Such ideas out of the ideas about themselves that they, what they tell of, themselves yeah. about themselves and what they tell the rest of the world about themselves mm. they built a solid brand just around that and it's all ideas big it is. ideas what brings to mind before yes. we get into mm -hmm. uh, your challenges and mm -hmm. not achieving your full potential like you said i remember one of your deputies mm -hmm. at, at a point i think uh, i don't know how many years ago whether it was last year mm -hmm. was talking about values and all of that mm -hmm. Sometimes I sit down and I pose the question on my mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. What does Ghana stand for? Mm -hmm. What are our values? Mm -hmm. What the Americans would talk about the American dream and we're mm -hmm. the place where you can come from anywhere mm -hmm. and make, make it. it. Mm -hmm. South Africa will try to paint itself as the rainbow country where mm -hmm. it's a melting pot of cultures. What are Ghanaian, what are our values, core values? Uh, I asked, and I asked that mm -hmm. question from the standpoint of if you asked, mm -hmm. if we went out there right now mm -hmm. and spoke to young people especially, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe some of us, yes, yes, we've been around long enough, but young people especially, I shudder to think what some of them <laughs> would say. What, what is your take on that and how much more can the NCC do? I, I, that think, I think that our core values, um, we find elements of our core values in our national anthem and the pledge. Mm. So for me, that's the starting point. Um, going back to the national anthem and starting to use it on a daily basis, because the words count, the things you say about yourself to yourself mm. make a difference in how you see the, yourself and how you see the world. We must, you know, go back to um, the fundamentals. I think where we derive our values from are the, are the values that we find in the, in the, in the national anthem and the pledge. So the fact that um, if you go out on the street and you ask people, they may not be able to identify what you, it's a huge gap. And it's a gap that, I mean, as NCC, we have to take some responsibility for. Because at the very minimum, people should have an idea of this. But we have had our challenges over the years in, in, in terms of the way, um, how we are able to work. But it's not a lost cause, it's a thing that we must jump on and start pushing extremely aggressively, particularly now, the way the world is. It is important to have clarity about what a society holds, as, as, uh, holds dear, the values that we want to uphold, and the way we want to live our lives. You know, all across the world, there's, there's confusion. You know, all the, all the big things that we thought were immovable are moving. Um, the way the world was structured, the relationship between states that we had a certain assumption about is no longer the case. And in all of this, it is important now to define for ourselves as a country what it is that we stand for. What is our own enlightened self-interest, for instance? What, um, what do we stand for? What do we want to promote? What do we want to achieve? Mm -hmm. It is time to go back and clarify those things and push it hard so that all Ghanaians will be looking at a common vision and working towards a common vision for that matter. Mm. I just want to quote the words of uh, the Ghana National Anthem mm -hmm. here so we take a look at it. And of course, many people forget that there's more than one stanza Yes. to the National Anthem. But let's just stick to the first since we're talking about those values, mm -hmm. and pick out for me what you feel, because that is what we use. Mm -hmm. God bless our homeland, Ghana. Make our nation great and strong, bold to defend forever the cause of freedom mm -hmm. and of right. Fill our hearts with true humility. Make us cherish fearless honesty mm -hmm. and help us to resist oppressors' rule with all our will and might forevermore. Here's what I see looking at this. Mm -hmm. Our nation. Some would say strong should even come before great, but it is mm -hmm. what it is, great and strong. I feel we could have been a much greater nation after 66 years, but who knows? Bold to defend forever. I don't know whether we've been bold in managing our national resources, in 
putting ourselves where, on that pedestal, judging from where we were in 1957 mm -hmm. and the sort of aura we had globally. Freedom and of right. I could go back to some of the recent mm -hmm. dynamics when it comes to assessments by the United States, among others, mm -hmm. where we are in terms of freedom, freedom of speech, among others. As for humility, I'll leave that out. <laughs> Fearless honesty, resisting oppressors' rule. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves in the throes of neocolonialism, a world where neocolonialism is at its peak, just as Nkrumah predicted. Mm -hmm. What then would you say we have done on this front? Just very briefly, you've already answered the question, but since you mentioned the anthem, I yes, wanted to I mentioned the anthem. put it back to you. Um, I, I don't want to dwell on what was done and what was not done. I want to dwell on the fact that these are the values we must be actively promoting from now on. Right. So, I mean, that's the angle I want to take. But what was done, what was not done, we are where we are. We know the situation we find. Is, yeah. Yes, it is what it is. We know the situation we find ourselves in. Um, bold to defend forever the cause of freedom and of right. Fill our hearts with true, with true humility. humility. Make us cherish fearless, fearless honesty. honesty. Are we an honest people? That's, that's, that's my favorite part. Mm. Make us cherish fearless honesty. I think it's the most melodious part. And make us cherish, and people butcher it. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> even sing the wrong lyrics. But that portion especially. And help honesty. us to resist oppressor's rule. I dare say we are not a very honest people. I dare say. My position in all of this is that we must work towards it. Mm. We must work towards this. So the things, I mean, as at, at 30 years, while we are trying to change the constitution, we must change ourselves as well. Yeah. We, must, we must recommit to the values of the national anthem. You know? So it's not just the constitution. A lot of times we like to externalize um, blame for the things that go wrong and things that are not happening. Uh, in, in this whole conversation around 30 years, there's very little said about how do we change ourselves? Mm. How do we become a better people? How do we assess ourselves as, as individuals, as families, as communities, us, you know, as, as, as opposed to that constitution that is on the outside, you know? So it's a good time to um, look at that and recommit to the values that, you know, form, form our national anthem. Mm. And I like to focus on, on that going forward. And what do we do as a, as a people? How do we work to ensure that these things resonate with us? How do we become passionate about these words and, and, and commit to push till we get there, you know, or till we get to as close to the ideal as possible? How do we become a people who are known for, for, for fearless honesty? How do we become people who, uh, who are positioned as people who will resist oppressors' rule so that oppressors will think twice before they come near us. Right. You know, so we must gradually... It's progressive, uh, isn't it? Yes, it's progressive. And we must build these things back into daily life. Mm. You know, what does this mean for me at work to be fearlessly honest? What does it mean to resist oppressors' rule? What does it mean for a teacher? What does it mean for a, a bank manager? What does it mean for a politician? <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean for, for a media for, person? For a media person. It's, what does it tricky. mean for a child? You see, <laughs> we must translate these values in, to go beyond the beautiful, inspiring words right. into things that uh, we live out in our daily life. Right. So you wake up every morning, and you you you, you the words shape how you how your day evolves or right. how your day pans out. Let's talk about the challenges of the mm -hmm. NCC. You spoke about not achieving your full potential yes. over time, yes. including within your, your tenure. Mm -hmm. And of course, tenure has barely spoke, started, you, please. You spoke about it. <laughs> uh, well, you're about a year into it. No, so. not even a year yet. So, context, so, so from June, right? <laughs> yes. We're in May. You are just about, you're a month shy of one year. So uh, at least I think for now, if you were a few months, we would, but the challenges, you mm -hmm. mentioned logistics yes. earlier, and that is common knowledge. Yes. But, but from, from where you sit, yes. what have been the challenges that have hobbled okay. the NCC? So it's common knowledge. Again, people don't understand the depth of it. Mm. And the fact that this commission has been systematically defunded from day one. Defunded? Yes. 
How so? underfunded, um, deprioritized from day one, mm. you know, and marginalized, I marginalized guess. as well. And we see the effects of that now. So sometimes when you when you say that, oh, when people say, oh, they are not funded, they don't even think through what does not funded mean. Not funded means that there's an office somewhere out there in some district where uh, there are no chairs and tables. Mm. I mean, if you translate the not funded into liter literal things, that the picture it paints is pretty horrendous. Computers, tables, chairs, bicycle, motorbike, you know, imagine going to your office and having to figure out your own table and chair. You, you see, so, so that the level... Well, some poor students do that. Yes, so, so, yes, 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 yes. We've that, covered that incidents well. in the Pandai district, 7,000 yes. desks deficit. Yeah. At least we got some action on that. Yeah, <laughs> that's as well. But what I'm saying is that, um, so... But that's I'm not just to justify to what no, is no, happening. Not, not, at, I mean, all, not, not at, at all, not at all. But not what I'm trying way. to say is that when people, when we talk about not being funded, um, there's more to it. It, 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 it translates into it real challenges. People don't really People understand. don't understand the real challenges yeah. that it, it translates into. Mm. It translates into sometimes you don't have paper. It translates into um, there's a big Has hole. Has that happened since you've taken over? Hopefully not. No. <laughs> we, we've had paper. You know, we've had paper. We, we've had paper. <laughs> we don't have we don't have pickups and motorcycles, but we have paper. So. Okay. All right. At <laughs> least know. I guess you're one of the luckier ones. There. Right. No, but 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 this this is very real. If 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 the situation is going to be fixed, we are coming from such a low level that it will take a continuous investment over years mm. to get us to um, a, a respectable operational level. But even with this, and I always emphasize this, even with all this depravity, the staff are some of the most hardworking people you will find in this country, mm. dedicated and committed to the work that they do. And, and you know that because the, the conditions under which they work will put many people off, will put many, many people off. Every time we recruit, um, within six months, a good number leave because the conditions are so poor uh, it becomes very problematic. But they work. There are people who were talking about the civic education clubs. So in the district, the district is supposed to have a number of clubs. And every officer must have a certain number of clubs that they have oversight of. So we have to do things like, um, because we don't have a motorbike to go to the far reaches of the district, each officer will have to um, go to the schools that they can walk to, for instance. Mm. So schools around where you live and schools around the office. And they are literally walking from school to school to get, to get their job done. They are walking from community to community, from farm to farm to get their job done. They are words, arriving... This is, this is a labor of love. Yes, I've they heard are similar arriving, talk from the NDPC as yes, well. Yes, they are about. arriving at work mm. dusty and sweaty because walked for miles and miles to get to where they have to go. You, you understand? And so, and yet in all of this, able to do great spectacular work, you know, but definitely only scratching at the potential because we could do so much more. We could be part, I mean, if properly included, we could be part of the transformation of this country to its, um, to its glory optimal that we are level. all yes optimal level that we are all yearning for so hard you know we, we could be part of that great story if if properly included you know and and we, we must start looking at that the whole world and you know something the issue of civics you know interestingly is something that the whole world is coming back to because the countries that we talked about that invested in 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 in, in deliberate civics um, particularly for the West, you know, post Second World War, put a lot of investment in this American dream you're talking about. This ideal, um, uh, who is the ideal look at American? The Scandinavian countries. Look at what they've done. They, they, all these things, the investments were done. But if you look at those countries, yeah, and you see those that ha are having problems and those that are stable, you will see a clear trend of those that systematically defunded their civics programs. 
and those that maintain them. It's very clear, mm. you know. So, so, so the investment, you can't run away from it. There is no other way around it. You can't get it done any other way. Talking of that investment, mm -hmm. then, just, just quickly on this point, um, what is your budget like? In a given year, how how good is it? How much is okay. it meeting? I want us to be very practical. Oh no no no! Are you meeting ten percent of what your expectations are? Okay. Recently, we were talking about the APFA from the PIAC report. Mm -hmm. The APFA areas where there are certain allocations that are not being met. What is mm -hmm. it like realistically for the NCC? Oh, <laughs> you know when I joined, when I joined the commission, I used to wonder at the figures. I used to think, oh, this 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 has to be a mistake because. <laughs> If we are sending this amount of money to a district for a month, then, 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 then I don't know what we are doing here. In the last few years... You best believe it. I heard something similar for social welfare. <laughs> we can't discuss it here. You know, but once, when, when COVID happened, mm. I think it served as a bit of an eye-opener. for it Because once COVID happened and where the country was in a panic and we needed a, somebody to go around and do the public education, an institution that is purpose built for that. In many countries, they now had to find people. They now had to find people, train them, do that. In Ghana, NCC was good and ready to go. And so um, we were tasked to, to undertake uh, the, the public education but then it was immediately immediately realized that oh these people have they have the they they have the men and the women <laughs> you know they have the human resources but that's that's about it you know and so even transportation to go around because you know how COVID was one had to go down to communities and because COVID was so new and you know was so fearful especially in the beginning. It was important to leverage the trust that has been built by our, uh, our district offices because of the way we are structured. And that trust became um, you know, a bridge to be able to you know, deploy the COVID information and get you know, a good uptake as we did. So after 2020, we did much better on the, on the budget level because I think at that point, it went beyond People saying NC has no money. It was now they could see what is not well resourced, what it meant in reality, and how it hindered work. So after 2020, we did better. But last year was not good because last year, once the economic crisis, I guess when you are, they are looking at priorities, maybe we are not, we will, we will not be foremost. How, how much? How much was budgeted for the NCC last year? Um, and how much came to? Came you? through. I think that we started off with the budget, approved budget of I think it was about 13 million or something like that. These are approximations, they're sure. not, they're not, yeah. And then it was reviewed downwards to about 8 million. That's already about 5 million shaved off. Yes, in the long run last year we received, I don't want to make a mistake, maybe, let me say a minimum of 2 million. Maybe more, but I can I can say that. So ballpark figure, we understand. Ballpark, ballpark ball, figure. Ballpark. And so it was a difficult year, as you can imagine. But it was a difficult year for the whole country, for all the government agencies. So it was one of those years. This year we've started off on a slightly better note. Um, our approved budget um, came to about six million, but and then but unusually. We got a release in the first quarter, and we're getting a release. I like how you say unusually. Very unusual. You, you usually don't get it. <laughs> we usually don't get it. Okay. You know, we usually don't get it. The first releases will come further down the line. But as soon as the year started, we got um, our, our first quarter release. Okay. And then we are, we've actually um, seen our, our second quarter release on the system as well. So year on year, you know, maybe a little bit of progress with dips. But generally speaking, getting better, hopefully. So obviously a whole lot more has but to be done in that regard. The, the amount, six million, it's woefully inadequate. It does not begin to scratch the surface of our needs. So let's hit, let's hit the nail on the head on that. Mm -hmm. From where you sit, you've mm -hmm. been here. Mm -hmm. You've been here as a deputy. You've yes. been here yes. as the, the, the chairperson. Yes. 
how much averagely if you had to do look i grew up looking watching some hiv ads and a whole lot of things that back mm -hmm. then the mm -hmm. ncc was backing was, yeah. we don't see them anymore mm -hmm. We've seen spikes in our HIV levels in the country mm -hmm. in recent years. Yeah. There are so many areas where people say, even on the political front, mm -hmm. we have to be doing. We're entering an electoral year, and mm -hmm. that's a question mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be putting District level you. elections. So yeah. mm -hmm. what then would be appropriate, optimal, looking at the work the NCC can do mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. ensure that you're able to you know, meet your optimal levels? So let me tell you what will be, what will be helpful. So for instance, mm -hmm. We are not sitting here demanding that, that give us money to buy pickups and motorbikes, for instance. Just give us the pickups and motorbikes. You right. will go and find it and bring it to us. We, we are not about, so the reason why I'm saying this is now, it's not really about the money, it's about find, giving us the resources. Mm. During COVID- Do you collaborate though with the information services department? Yes, we do, but you, let me make this you, point. You use their just, stuff just, sometimes, right? No, they use our stuff. We they use, use your stuff yeah, right. as well. So, 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 um, mm. so during COVID, what I talked about the difficulty that we ran into. Um, there were some pickups that had been bought for another institution, but were given to us and we're able to work with it. Mm. You, you, you understand? So our thing is not to go about mentioning mm. money because um, a certain amount of money will be unrealistic and dismissed up front. But give us. What if? Yes. Another twist. What if you L could ask let and me, it would be given? Let me tell you give us the equipment that we need. Okay. Give us the so equipment what that we need. Cars, we need pickups. So we need pick motorbikes. motorbikes. Um, we need accommodation, office accommodation. Mm. Uh, in a lot of districts, we are housed in the assembly, but in many districts, uh, we are renting. In some districts, you can't even find a place to rent. Or well, what you what you can find to rent, is really not fit for human occupation. You understand? Even this building, right? When it rains. The office that I used to sit in before, it literally rains in the office because the. the is that the, office still in use? Yes, it's in use. The deputy chair still the deputy sits is there. there. Yes. You and know. So that person has to face that situation now? Yes. So when it rains, you, you, you get out of the place because it, it's, it's, it's scary to sit there during the rain. You know, so if we are going to cost all of these things, but fix the building. You see what I mean? I get your point. Uh -huh. so, Provide us with yeah, what we dude, need. Give, give us what we need because we want to work. It's not really about give us so much money and all. We want to work. What do we need to work? We need, um, we need transportation. We need accommodation. We need computers and chairs and tables so we can work. If you think that calling the money will become, you know, a back and forth, just give us the things that About we how need. many computers, for example? Let's just focus on one. How oh. many computers, laptops would you need or desktops? So how many districts do we have? I don't think that we have computers in even half the districts. It's too, you, you, you understand? Right. So. I get the picture. Yeah, so it's a lot of computers. We're looking at around 300, right? It's a lot of computers. If we had one computer, even one computer per district, we'd be able to say that, you know, work is a computer with a printer, you mm -hmm. know, but. So majority of districts don't have them. Majority of districts don't have um, a pickup mm. or motorbikes to be able to, because, excuse me, our work is outreach. It's community work. We can't sit in the office and work. You, you understand? I get it. Yes. So we have to go out there. We can do a lot of work on social media now. It's picking up. We're doing more and more there. We can do a lot of work through the media. We use the media to um, propagate our messages and all of that. But at the end of the day, in many parts of the country, it boils down to meeting people, building trust so that you'll be able to so that the messages that you give them, they will take. Yeah, it will resonate with them and yes. you need the logistics to do that. Exactly. Let, let's cap off the conversation talking about governance issues. Okay. I've saved this for last. Mm -hmm. I would like to start with you, 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 are, you have a fellowship with the National Endowment for Democracy mm -hmm. in the United States. Yes. And congratulations on that, by the way. But when you look at that vis-a-vis -vis our press freedom, ratings, for example. Mm -hmm. Over the last two years, they've mm -hmm. taken a tumble from 62nd to 60th. We've, we've been dipping a bit, mm -hmm. 30th at a point. I think the best we've had is 2015. We placed mm -hmm. 22nd mm -hmm. within the last decade mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. So 22nd and 2015 to 62nd, that's a 40 point mm -hmm. decline. Mm -hmm. 
we can talk about corruption mm -hmm. and it's become pandemic mm -hmm. in our country mm -hmm. it's not just i mean i remember the, the finance minister himself ken ofoyeta uh, some time back saying that we lose between four and six billion mm -hmm. cds you know mm -hmm. every year yeah some have said that if we're able to stem the tide, 22% of the public sector wages go into unearned salaries. People don't earn them. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about these? And well, what role can the NCCE well, play? The NCCE can play a role, but what I'd like to say is that every other institution must also play their role. Mm. This is a country that is not lacking in laws, mm. that is not lacking in rules. That is not lacking in uh, uh, um, definitions of, of uh, consequences for the things that go wrong. We should all just do our work. We should do our work of educating the public. We cannot arrest anybody. Mm. Those who must arrest, must arrest. Mm. <laughs> those who should prosecute, must prosecute. Mm. You know, those who should speak up, should speak up. We must all do our work. And that is what I see when it comes to this thing. because. Everybody likes to talk about the other person who is not doing their work or the other person who should be doing this. We are always trying to identify, you know. We like to push the buck yeah, yeah. to but the next person. We all have res responsibilities, you know, in, in, in the Republic. You know, in the, in the social contracts, we all have roles. You know, if you are going to pay your taxes, then you better be demanding accountability properly. Right. You, you, you see what I mean? Right. That is, the, that is the relationship in the social contract that forms the basis for the democracy. The taxpayer gives up an income. They elect a government. The government is supposed to provide certain services and account to the people. We have systems for accountability. We need to activate and use them. This is not a country where we say we don't have laws for corruption or we don't have laws uh, um, for, for, for people doing this or that. We have all of them. So we must all be up and doing. Mm. And everybody must do their job. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. And uh, I only brought it to your doorstep because we're interacting with you yes. now. But <laughs> let me ask you this, again mm -hmm. on governance, mm -hmm. not as NCC boss, mm -hmm. as a Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. We've knocked on the doors of the IMF 17 times. Mm -hmm. I, I, some people do not realize, but the British mm -hmm. went once mm -hmm. to the IMF under certain conditions. I believe some 40 plus uh, 50 years thereabouts. Mm -hmm. They learned quick lessons, never looked back. We have gone time and again, mm -hmm. and we've been warned, mm -hmm. this administration, past administrations, mm -hmm. when we are on the precipice, we always, we always know. get here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think about our economy? and? moving forward, the things we can do. Again, mm -hmm. as a citizen, not okay. as NCC. First of all, you must know that I cannot speak as a citizen as long as I'm sitting in this chair. You must know that. <laughs> when you, I speak, you, can, you can choose to detach my, <laughs> You don't necessarily have to speak as NCC. My boss. opinions are attached to the commission. But you are right. Mm. There are many structural problems mm. about our economy. For years, we've been saying the same thing, uh, we, must be, we must move from just agriculture to processing. For how long have you not said that? Did not, didn't they say that you when we were in primary school? Yes, we must stop. Um, we're almost tired of hearing that. Yes, we must stop exporting raw cocoa and raw... Uh, and, and, we must and process oil. our gold. We must process refineries. our gold. It's interesting refine. how Switzerland we must processes most of... The, World we must refine, they themselves don't produce any. We must refine our gold, we must process our cocoa. The things we must do, I don't think any country huh, has better articulated the solutions to its problems than, than we has. have. Right. So we know. Mm. And so whenever we pick a path, we know exactly where it's heading because we know the, the situation we live in and we know how to fix it. I don't, the, I mean, you will put any panel together and talk about the problems we have and the solutions. There are a lot of, there are a lot of people who can, who can you know, very smartly articulate all of that. So again, I say that we must all be up and doing. If, you're, if yours is to ensure that um, 
people do the right thing, please ensure that. Ours is to ensure that people are educated. In the context of what we are given, we must ensure that our conscience is free and we do the best we can under the circumstances. And that, for me, is the thing that drives me. Um, I don't like to talk about the resources issue a lot because it gives the impression that we don't get anything done because we don't have anything. No. I always say that we, do the, work we the do the best mm. with what we, or what, what we have. You know, right. We do the best with what we have. Um, we don't get funding only from, from government. We get funding from donors sometimes. We are currently running a major <clears> project um, on preventing and containing violent extremism, which is a big problem in our country now. When you asked about governance and all that, I wanted to use this opportunity to identify a couple of things that I think are a threat to the democracy. You know, Maybe and we can look at that briefly. Yes, very briefly. But that's, that, for me, is the most important part of this conversation. Mm. And the first one being the monetization of the politics and the governance. Mm, because we have monetized it to a point where now it's almost like democracy for sale. It's dangerous for us to go down that path. It, 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 it's, not, it's not right that we have to make huge demands on um, politicians, for instance, who are seeking public office. You, you, you understand? We go into a vicious cycle. We demand and they have to find ways and means of supplying money for funerals and um, all kinds of other things in their community. Because if you don't, if you don't provide the funds, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be kicked out. So, so where, 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 where do, the monetization has really pushed us to a, not a great place as far as the, the democracy is concerned. Right. The other thing <clears throat> that we are really playing with that is so dangerous is galamsey. You know? That was the very next thing I was going to ask you about. <laughs> because for me, my heart breaks, and uh, we have a few minutes to digest mm -hmm. these issues, but you look at our river, our water bodies. We grew up seeing them in textbooks and the rest. Looking pristine. You can't imagine them now. And even on the Volta Lake, mm -hmm. now some people, whether sand winning, there are activities that yeah, are, even yeah. beach, the beaches, the beaches, people are winning, winning sand, sand yeah, from the illegally, beaches. Yeah. If tomorrow, God forbid, there is something and the, the waves come, yeah. the same people will be affected. You can't look at the Ancobra now. You can't look at the Pra. You can't look at the Brim. All of them, the tunnel, well, have you become... See, it, it goes beyond, for me, it goes beyond the muddy pictures. It goes to health and security. The food we are consuming. Because we are consuming food that is being grown with this water that is contaminated. And in the areas that, where the, the mining is happening, we are already seeing some you know, signs of health problems that will hit us hard once the kids that are being born will. Then, but the most important thing is the security threat as far as uh, Ngalamze is concerned. The thing, it was, it was, it was the, the, the search for diamonds that fueled the war in Liberia. Yeah. And it was the illegal mining of diamonds, which became, then led to warlords and exchange of guns. I actually for, lived in that country around that yeah, time, so, so I know exactly so you know, what exa happened. <laughs> and, 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 and we are not far from that. There's a thing called blood diamonds in this world. Sierra Leone. You know, Typical, wh yeah. why, why is there a thing like that? Mm. Because something terrible happened. Do we want blood gold in this country? Is that where we want mm. to head? Because if you persist with Gamze the way we are doing, it's, it's a direct road to Liberia and Sierra Leone of the 90s. Disaster. Kathleen Adi, what next for you at the NCC? Oh, the NCC is going places. Mm. That's, that much I'll tell you. We have great plans. Um, we want to really embark on this uh, this fight for the minds and hearts of people, the fight for the, the hearts and minds of, 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 of Ghanaians. We want um, the values that, at the very minimum, we find in our national anthem to guide us in our daily life. We want those values to guide us in our daily life, you know? And we want our country to achieve its full potential. And we think that our role as civic educators is critical to the success of our country. Mm -hmm. And we are here and ready to work. And we are committed to Project Ghana and to ensuring that Project Ghana succeeds. Right. This country is great 
I mean, we, we, we come into countryhood. Multidimensionally great. We come mm -hmm. into countryhood with so much. There's no reason for us to be the way we are right now. You, you understand what I mean? So, yes, um, we, are, we have great plans at the Commission to do much better. Uh, I mean, we are constantly engaging government to ensure that, you know, they understand where we are coming from and that they see us as a partner that will help every government succeed. You know, when you have a people who are enlightened and educated and people who understand their, their responsibilities, it's easier for a government. Right. You know, so, so we, we, we have a lot of work to do, but we are up to the task. And as usual, we are doing the best we can with what we have always. Kathleen Ali, we're grateful that you took the time to get mm -hmm. interactive with us. And we can only wish you the very best on this journey mm -hmm. as you lead the NCCE, mm -hmm. hopefully into that next era mm -hmm. of greatness. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. All right. And that has been an interaction with Kathleen Adi. She is chairperson uh, for the National Commission for Civic Education. Hopefully you enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for watching.